what we're going to show you here um, is a little bit of sort of the proof of what we've done and then go into our collaboration together and then talk about, in general, personalized medicine in healthcare. Let's see if the uh, advancer works. Ah, let's see those pictures. There we go. I guess the pictures don't show. Well, there's a, <laughs> there's a, there's a picture of, uh, of a doctor on the right, and it says, I am not a doctor. And it also says, picture of Marcus Welby, for those of us that are old enough. It says, nor do I play one on TV. Uh, and even worse, and there's a picture of Alan Turing. Even worse, I'm not an engineer. So what this, con this presentation is entirely about context. Uh, and if you have advanced questions, I'll be delighted to connect you with our uh, very bright science team, of which I am not one. So here's the problem. Healthcare is broken in society today. This is a quote from one of our collaborators, um, uh, Jim Hildebrand. And uh, basically, he said that healthcare is, as practiced today, is it too loud? No, okay. Healthcare as practiced today is broken. And uh, uh, it is not sustainable. It's 17 and change percent of our entire economy, over $3 trillion. Um, even worse, it's not delivering the results that we'd like it to. It's, uh, you know, you guys have been through the process. We have loved ones who've been through the process. We're spending all this money, and it would be nice if we got the benefit the bang for the buck. Something like 30% of hospital admits are due to um, adverse events, um, which is something that uh, with perhaps a little better technology applied uh, that can, you know, we can solve that. And a bunch of it is from misdiagnoses, and that's uh, another thing. So the question on the table is, can HPC and data improve healthcare? Oh, goodness, okay. <laughs> so no, no pictures whatsoever at all. Interesting translation. Um, this is a graph. It, it kind of doesn't matter. <laughs> there we go. It's, it's over there on the, uh, on the, on the. It needs to be on the internet. I have a PDF in there. Here, let me open up a PDF. You should be able to just connect to the internet. It's not on the internet, so let's just do documents. Vista. Don't look too closely here, guys. Let's see. <laughs> Conferences. Let's see. Final PDF. There we go. Let's see if that works. Okay. Um, make that big. Who knew the technology would be a problem? Hey, there we go. <laughs> My doctors. Okay. So this chart uh, uh, just shows that basically data is expanding um, faster than Moore's Law. This is just two data sets. Neuroimaging and genomics, you can imagine. Yeah, uh, what the slide is, the Full Employment Act for everyone in this room. Um, oh, that's... <laughs> that'll just make it interesting. Let me get it through this so you guys can get through that. Can get out of here. <laughs> so uh, there's two kinds of data there's that, that we look at. There's general patient data and then there's uh, the sort of body of knowledge data. As a society, we've spent about $2 trillion over the last 50 years gathering personalized medicine and, um, and uh, general biomedical knowledge. That's money spent by the uh, government, spent by pharmaceutical companies, and almost all that data bubbles up into the public domain. It bubbles up into um, research papers that are eventually published, it bubbles up into patents, and when there's a problem, it bubbles up into the, um, yeah, that's really annoying, isn't it? It bubbles up into uh, FDA errors. And we gather up all that data um, and use it to, to answer the question, can we use this data along with generalized patient data, both the data for the specific patient and the data for um, the pa all the patients in general to answer biomedical questions? So we thought we'd ask three ways. First, we'd start with, can we develop better therapies using this data? Then we asked, can we predict adverse events with this data? And then finally, can we do something more complex, which is looking at the multiplex problem of the patient? And the way I like to look at it is I like to say, grandma shows up at the hospital. She's got six comorbidities. Comorbidities are things like high blood pressure, diabetes, um, any number of things, high cholesterol. And she's taking four or five medicines to combat those. She also has, of course, her unique genotype and her unique phenotype. And um, the combination of all that, the doctor has then got, she presents with cancer as the primary indication. 
And the question then becomes, what is the best frontline therapy in cancer given the six medicines, the six diseases in the context of this woman's genotype and phenotype? It's basically a large multiplex data question that is more than most humans can answer. Certainly it's tough for a doctor who's got 15 minutes scheduled to see her. So to answer the first question here, can data be used to develop better therapies more cost effectively, um, things like drug discovery? Um, we gave it a shot, and this is what we found. Basically what BioVista does is it gathers up that lar this large body, the, the large body of biomedical data on the bottom here, um, and organizes it into a few dozen different silos of data. It organizes and characterizes that data in certain ways, and it atomizes the, the data packet into different things that are relevant. And then it uses that data to compare to other things so you can compare like to like. And what it does is we, we use a barcode as a representation. You could use a fingerprint. But basically, it gathers everything that characterizes a given thing, whether that's a drug or a disease or an adverse event or a, geno a, ge a gene, any of those things. And it characterizes it. And what we found when we did this, and I think this red button is the, there we go. This is what was the known body of data back then. It was an autoimmune disease. This is for MS, by the way. Um, uh, you know, there was a lot of work being done uh, here. But we said, based on the barcode, the fingerprint, that, you know, it's also an autoimmune disease, and it's also a, not a mitochondrial dysfunction, excuse me, a mitochondrial dysfunction disease. And this was now, is now known, but it wasn't known at the time. Um, so we tried, and we said, all right, given this, this parameter here, what of the, you know, tens of thousands of drugs um, or hundreds of thousands of compounds that are out there might be useful in combating this issue. So what we did is we ran our system and we came up with a number of, of, of candidates. Of those, we then applied business filters. We said, all right, we'd like it to be a safe drug because otherwise it's pointless. We'd like it to be orally available because that's the easiest mode of administration. Ideally, we'd like it not to be sold in the United States because if it's a 60-year-old generic drug and it's aspirin, there's no intellectual property value. We've changed that. We'd actually like to find cheap, free stuff in the US now for our new initiative, but back then we were looking at securing IP. So what we did is we came up with two drugs. One, this is dimabolin, an old Russian histamine. Um, and this is Perlindol, a Spanish antidepressant. And we put it in the MOGIA model, which is sort of the gold standard. Here is no treatment. This is how sick the mouse gets. This is the amount of time. Um, this is no treatment. This is dexamethasone, works great, but it kills the mouse, small side effect. Uh, this one here was uh, um, BVA 101, uh, the um, uh, Dimabon. You can see it arrests the progress of the disease. Same thing over here on the Perlindol, slightly different mechanism of action. Here we go, no treatment. The arrest, this you can see, our drug arrests the disease. And um, we have shown the efficacy here. We've gotten patents on this. If any of you would like to develop drugs in MS, call us. We'll uh, be happy to license it to you cheap since that's not what we're doing right now. So next thing that came, the FDA came to us and said, Again, can we use data and HPC to improve health generally? And here they said, you know, everyone in America seems to be taking a statin these days. We think there's got to be some side effects. We don't know what it is. Can you tell us what patient subpopulations might be negatively affected by statins? So we did some work and we said that we thought that hypothyroidism, i.e. low performing thyroid function, was a risk factor for diabetes. So, well, that's very nice. We predicted it, so, so what? So we tested it against um, a large body of patient data, um, um, the uh, healthcare records, the EMR data uh, that Claylet has. Claylet is uh, Israel's uh, database of patient records. It's about four million people covered. Not the largest in the world, but statistically significant. And what we found was that, indeed, hi hyperthyroidism is uh, um, a condition that is that if you take statins, the odds of you're getting diabetes goes way up. And we can see that sort of do a virtual clinical tryout, trial, back testing it against the patient data. And so uh, we, did, we did a paper with the FDA in Claylet. Here it is published in the American Diabetes Association's Diabetes Care. So again, what we've tried to do here 
is answer the first two questions. Can you develop better therapies? Again, that is all drugs against a condition. In, that, in our case, it was MS. And then the second one is, can you predict adverse events, i.e., what patient subpopulation is likely to be negatively affected by a drug? So we thought, okay, well, that's pretty simple. Those are one-to-one -one things. What do you do in the case with grandma with her six comorbidities, taking six drugs, her unique genotype and phenotype? What is the optimal care for her? And that's the subject of our collaboration with HPE. So we began uh, about uh, four months ago. Um, we um, are leveraging our data and AI platform um, and HPE's power. Um, we, our end goal is to create what we call a clinical de decision support system, i.e., something that a doctor can use when they show up and they've got the patient and they've got 15 minutes to see the patient. How can we answer that question? Grandma's got six drugs, six comorbidities, genotype, phenotype. What's the best frontline therapy given the disease at hand? And we'd like to have that called an intake analysis before the doctor even shows up. That's our end goal. Um, uh, so what we did is what we're starting similarly. We are working with some hospitals. One of them is Sarah Bush Lincoln, a community hospital in central Illinois. Um, one of the reasons we're excited to work with them is there are 5,000 community hospitals. If we can deliver the power of the last 50 years of biomedical research along with the ability to um, access patient medical record data and combine those two to help patients, you know, help doctors treat patients, we think that would be great, particularly if we could roll that out in the community hospital setting. Why? Because p most patients would rather be cared locally. So uh, if we bring this to community hospitals and it works, then community hospitals can provide first class personalized medicine with local care, which is what people want. So here was a patient zero. This one was actually done at Mayo. We're releasing our first ones for Sarah Bush. Um, this, we did this for a, a Mayo patient. A 62 year old female, breast cancer, she was undergoing the standard of care. Thank God it was working. So what our team did was saying, you know, she was also being treated for depression and anxiety. Um, and she had a history of hypothyroidism as well. Um, so our approach was, this is about life and death. This isn't theoretical. First, do no harm. Standard of care is working, don't mess with it. What can we do to optimize the drugs to treat her other conditions to improve her cancer? Um, so we looked at drugs to treat um, uh, her depression and her anxiety and came up with the following results. So this is what an output looks like. The, um, the system takes these parameters and says, <clears throat> of the world of antidepressants, treating ER plot positive HR minus breast cancer to breast cancer, what are the compounds in the world's formularies that are most likely to have um, a strong effect against the, the part of the cancer we're targeting. And we came up with this list of people. Then what happens is our system then goes back and says, which of these are known by biomedicine as, you know, as being good treatment options? And it goes back and it colors the known knowns green. We like to think of these as positive controls for our predictions. And of this, we looked for various different parameters and came up that this particular drug, um, uh, an antidepressant, would be better than the one she was currently taking because of uh, the way it addressed uh, her cancer. Similarly, um, we looked at um, what supplement she was taking. Again, we didn't want to take on the male's doctor's frontline choice because it was working. So these were, she was taking a bunch of supplements. We suggested a couple supplements of these to replace the supplements she was taking. Again, we're trying not to increase the drug load on the patient, we're just trying to improve it. Here, Unfortunately, most frontline therapies don't work over time. They merely extend your life. Standard of care extends your life. It generally doesn't cure you. So we wanted to have something in the bag for when she came back and said, golly, it's not working. So this was our suggestion of another standard of care uh, that we thought would work um, as well as the frontline therapy and be a good second choice. We also have, they've come back to us now, and we're actually working on some non-standard of care responses for this particular patient. So what are our takeaways? Our takeaways from this is that technology truly can deliver, make a difference. And um, um, I can tell you other stories offline um, of situations where we've done this work 
and truly saved some lives. Actually, I'll tell one since we've got a few minutes. My dad was a um, guy with some yank, and he had the best advisors. He had something called CLL, uh, a form of leukemia. It's a blood disease. And he was getting sicker and sicker, and he was sitting in a clean room. And he had doctors from Johns Hopkins, which, by the way, is a great institution. He was able to talk to people who were studied in the thing at NIH. And he's just getting sicker and sicker. And so I finally said, visiting with a mask on, and I said, Dad, I know I was a C student in high school. <laughs> Will you forgive me and let our team look at this? And he's one of those dismissive, well, whatever, son, OK. So within a week, our team put together a report. And fortunately, in his case, it was very easy. He had some parts of, what is, of his phenotypic and genotypic profile that made choice A worlds better than his choice B. They made the, God bless the doctor, because I think the number one problem in healthcare is humans willing to use better information, overcome their egos, et cetera. This was a great doctor. He said, sure, we'll change it. Six weeks later, he's out of the hospital. Six months later, mind you, I'd had a mask on to talk to him because of um, you know, his susceptibility to disease. Six months later, we're on a plane flying to Spain for a vacation. And he lived for another four and change years, died of something completely different. When they died, they never found the leukemia in his body. So that's why I'm so passionate about this. Um, our takeaways from this is technology really can make a difference. And that's what we're trying to do here. Scalability is needed. Um, I can't think of a better partner than HPE to help us uh, with this problem in scale. Um, we think we're pretty good. Uh, we're not deliver healthcare to the world <laughs> good. <laughs> and uh, uh, we hope that partnering with HP will allow us as a team to do it. Um, and then um, we've also learned that the existing data must be seamlessly integrated. Um, uh, we have to be able to deliver this data to biomedical professionals to do their work in their current workflow. And how we do that is part of what we're currently developing in the next stage of our collaboration together. And finally, um, we think that this data can not just help doctors and community hospitals, but we're optimistic that we can then take this data and go back and help people design drugs, help people avoid adverse events. Um, and uh, that's where we're going. So thank you guys very much. And uh, appreciate you letting us talk about it. It's, it's exciting. So, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, that was uh, great. Um, so I understand the tactical perspective is not so hard. It can be done tactically. What's, what's the cultural shift required to make this happen? Well, um, we, um, that, that, is the big, that is the big question. What we are, what, one of the things that we're doing, you know, we've, we spent a bunch of time working with HPE and, and looking at the, they, they got pretty comfortable with the science and that we could, as you said, do what we say we can do. The, what we're, where, we're, where we're all sort of interesting in working together in collaboration is, can we get the dogs to eat the dog food? And what we found, there was a slide in here that one of my guys took out, but that, um, oh, here we go. That the doctors, we, we pulled the doctors, we've seen, you've got to find the right doctor to start, and we've been fortunate to stumble on some of the right doctors that we think are excited to do things newly and differently. We also polled the doctors, and what we've learned is that generally, they all see it coming. They absolutely know that personalized medicine makes a difference. They know that they need it, but they don't know how, what it should look like. And that's where we, in our community, have the opportunity. We can help shape and design that solution. Sir. You're talking about speed and HPC, but yet you said in your father's case it took a week to get the data. What was the longest poll in the tent in that week-long sequence? Well, that was a number of years ago. Um, first, um, and in my father's case, it wasn't quite, we, there was some low-hanging fruit that we were able to find because part of what we do is find the known knowns, but part of the power of BioVista is looking at the unknown knowns. Again, the, this part, the greens are the knowns. This is the standard of care, what the world knows about, but there's all these other opportunities. Fortunately, in my dad's case, because of uh, his doctors hadn't had time to match his phenotypic and genotypic profile appropriately to his case. Um, they were missing an obvious choice. Part of what we're able to do today is go beyond that and look at some of these other non-obvious choices here. 
Does that help? Yes. So we had a question about ethics earlier, um, and it seems particularly relevant in mm -hmm. this area. So I wonder um, if you would just comment briefly on how your company out, uh, navigates the ethics of this area. It is a great question, and we want to thank HPE. Um, HPE is covering the costs of this work, and it's free to the hospitals at the moment that want to use it. What we're working on is ways to get the cost down low enough to fit into standard reimbursement codes to be able to make it you know, sort of available to all, which is one of the reasons we're trying to work with the community hospitals first, because that is the lowest cost of health care. Um, these, are, these are moral questions, and, um, and uh, it, it has been a, um, a bit challenging. We're very fortunate. We have um, um, some very good investors um, that are also happen to be very financially well off, and um, uh, they agree with us so that if we can find a way to make a difference, then, then we've won. So we're not, you know, unlike these drug companies that are charging enormous amounts of money, in our perfect world, if we do this right, we'll drive the cost of this service down to single-digit thousands, hopefully even someday sub-thousand dollars to run this service per patient, per outcome. Um, and that'll be covered by the reimbursement codes that are about 2,500 bucks from CMS and others right now for this sort of work. And that second, we can, in these opportunities here, we can find things that existing safe medicines will treat, things like aspirin, things like antihistamines, things that are available over the counter. It's actually amazing how powerful. Melatonin, for example, is a great anti-cancer drug, you know, and that's available. Heck, I bought it for my dog for eight bucks at the store. <laughs> Sir. Yeah. Is, do you have any difficulty getting access to enough personalized data for comparing against large patient populations? You know, that is a great question. There's two aspects to it. First is the HIPAA regulations and getting access to individual patient records. What we've done so we don't have to touch it um, is we have the hospitals at the moment anonymize the data before they send it to us. The, um, um, uh, we are developing a legal, pro legal protocol where we can, um, uh, as a member of the patient care team, we'll be able to log straight into Cerner, straight into Epic, straight into any of these EMR systems and pull the data directly and hopefully with HP's ease help pull that out directly, um, you know, uh, very efficiently, again reducing the cost. The other question is, what about the access to the large volumes of data? And um, we were very fortunate that the FDA used their heft to get us Claylitz data. We wouldn't have known how to reach them. Thank goodness the FDA, they can get done what they want. Um, but, you know, that will be a big question. Optima Healthcare and other large uh, holders of patient data see the value, and that will be a, a negotiation that will have to occur. Any So are you actually using the genomic data? Because that's been a real challenge. And when you talk about pulling data out of EMRs, the genomic data is not in it anymore. So how are you utilizing that? Because when you go to precision medicine, you're really talking about the patient's either genome or proteome, somehow the omics. So I'm, and, and that's not public to any place. So I'm a little confused on what data you're actually using right now. So there's two bodies of data. There's the world's biomedical knowledge, right, that's out there. And that's public data. That's data from places like PubMed, from FDA errors, from the patent database, from the journal articles that have been written. So all that, there is genetic data in there. D genetic data that we can use to characterize the drugs and the diseases and the adverse events and post-translational modifications, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Things that, those packets of data that go in. Um, um, so that helps inform our body of knowledge. Regarding the specific patients, I am not a doctor, as we saw in the first slide, uh, um, but we've had, the doctors have been sending us the genetic data. So if the patients have had a genetic test, they will send us that data. So we have had some genetic, we have had on certain patients the genetic data we need. Maybe not perfect, but the tests that were available. And again, we don't, so I, I'd like to address that, and again, I'm not a doctor or a scientist, but Everyone is focused in this world on genetics, genetics, genetics. And genetics is important. Genetics, in my mind, is the propensity of your body to do something. 
It might be a very high propensity, but it's a propensity. What I like to call, and I might be using the wrong word, what I like to call the phenotypic data is what is. You know what? I have the propensity to be an ectomorph. I was 168 pounds until whenever. You know what? I'm a little more than that right now. And so my genetics are that I should be 168, but my love of steaks has, uh, has uh, overcome it. So my phenotypic data, in this case, I think, is more relevant to my health than my genetic propensity. Is that, is that a fair answer? Okay. And again, that is one of the great experts in the field of this sort of thing. So, so uh, we would be very grateful if uh, you want to come collaborate with us in some way. So, so thank you. And uh, so that was that. And thank you guys for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.